we are now live, so we're officially starting the Tuesday. I've gotten my days right this week, the Tuesday morning uh, House Appropriations Committee meeting. And we are going to uh, start um, uh, with uh, some testimony. Uh, we have uh, JFO with us. We have Nolan Langwell, and we also have, I'm looking, Mike O'Grady, great, from Legislative Council, uh, who has uh, taken some of our discussion yesterday and worked off a base from the administration's proposal. Um, and I keep referring to it as stimulus equity. It's the $1,200 federal dollars that went out. And this, this addresses the Vermonters who were left behind. And so I would like to um, jump in with a draft uh, that, that, um, that Michael Grady has worked on. And Teresa sent this out and I, I apologize. I did not ask for the release of the draft to go to the committee. I forgot that little detail. And so this is a six page bill and, and I don't know if you had time to walk through it. You didn't receive it until um, this morning. So I apologize, that was my fault. But um, Mike, if you would like to walk through the pieces with us and this is just our, our initial draft to see uh, where we can move on this important bill. So Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you. And do we also have with us uh, Susanna Davis, the executive director? I haven't seen her yet, but she did say she would try to jump in. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, this is Mike O'Grady with Legislative Council. Uh, as the chair indicated, you have a draft in front of you that, that addresses or provides assistance to those uh, um, people living in Vermont that were not eligible for CARES Act assistance. Uh, you'll see that the bill proposes to establish a coronavirus relief assistance program for immigrants. There is a definition section. First, there is a reference to the CARES Act. Then there is a definition of who is an eligible, eligible adult. These are the main qualified recipients uh, for assistance under the program. There's an individual who is a resident of Vermont and who is ineligible to receive economic impact statements under the CARES Act due to immigration status. So we're gonna address the, de the issue of residency in one second, um, but then you'll see a definition of eligible child. It's an individual under 18 years of age for whom an eligible adult is a parent or legal guardian. Then you get the default definition of personally identifiable information. This is generally the definition that's used in statute elsewhere. If you go further on to page two, you'll see that immigration status is part of personally identifiable information. Uh, moving down to the definition of resident. Um, there's a couple, there are- Oh, I'm sorry, Mike, just for the committee, there's some information that probably we'll have questions about, but let's have you walk through before we have any questions. Sure. Thank you. Mike. Uh, there are a couple of different definitions of residency in statute, one of which is that it's just your domicile. It's an individual who's domiciled in Vermont. But then there's another definition um, other definitions, for example, under the uh, motor vehicle law, the driver's privilege uh, card, which is available to immigrants, uh, there's a qualification or, or um, certain people that don't qualify as a resident. And so we're using that definition here. So it's any individual living in Vermont who intends to make the state his or her principal place of domicile, either permanently or for an indefinite number of years Individuals who live in the state for a particular purpose involving a defined period of time, including students, migrant workers employed in seasonal occupations, and individuals employed under contract with a fixed term are not residents for purposes of this section. So those seasonal farm workers that come in on a visa to pick apples or strawberries, et cetera, would not be eligible, neither would students who are here on a student visa. Um, so I just wanted to be clear about that. 
Then you get the establishment of the program with eligibility and maximum award provisions. The program is established at the Agency of Human Services to award direct relief grant payments to eligible adults and eligible children. In order Mike, to receive- Mike, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just for um, committee's sake, that was dropped in there. Our committee hasn't made a determination. I, I just said either XXS or put in AHS and so that that's, you know, a, no decision has been made. I don't want anyone to think I've gone ahead and made decisions. These are all placeholders for discussion. Okay, Mike. Okay. So in order to receive a payment, an eligible adult certifies that they are a resident and that they were ineligible to receive an economic impact payment under the CARES Act due to their immigration status. Each eligible adult receives $1,200 and $500 for each eligible child, provided that an eligible adult shall not receive an award for an eligible child if another applicant received an award for that child. So there's no double dipping for your children. If mom and dad are both eligible adults, only mom or only dad would receive the benefit for the eligible child. Then you get to the administration of the program. It's administered by the Agency of Human Services in consultation with the Executive Director of Racial Equity. AHS shall partner with public or private entities. And so that's a mandate. It's not a may, it's a shall. Um, when I was drafting this language with Senate Ag a few months ago, talking to the advocates, um, the concept was that the, the potential eligible individuals would be more comfortable approaching some of the organizations in their local communities rather than trying to approach um, a state agency uh, or a state program. So it directs AHS to partner with public or private entities uh, as needed to conduct the outreach, provide application assistance, process grant applications, or deliver assistance payments to eligible individuals. The agency adopts uh, requirements, guidelines, procedures necessary to implement it. They shall not be required to go through rule. They're, de um, they're uh, determined to be, uh, they can then, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to follow along with Teresa, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, they may utilize staff and resources from other state agencies uh, and they may um, administer and may partner with any non-governmental entity to promote or implement the program. So then you get down to contract for implementation. Uh, notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, uh, meaning private contract limitations and statute, the agency may enter into contracts with non-governmental entities to implement and administer the program without the need to competitively bid such contracts. Uh, for purposes of the program, the public health risk posed by COVID shall be deemed to be an emergency situ situation that justifies execution of sole source contracts under Administrative Bulletin 3.5. A contract with an entity will, that will implement the program shall at a minimum provide that the contracted entity shall issue grant payments to eligible adults pursuant to provisions of the section and pursuant to the procedures established by the agency. And then you come to confidentiality and personally identifiable info, information um, restrictions. All personally identifiable information that's collected by the agency through the program or by any entity implementing the program shall be kept confidential and shall be exempt from inspection and copying under the Public Records Act. So just because uh, the agency producer acquired uh, the name or information from an eligible adult doesn't mean it's a public record. Uh, then you see that the agency shall ensure that any entity of state government performing a function or any entity the agency contracts with for the program uh, will implement appropriate procedures and safeguards to protect any PII, uh, shall not disclose an individual's PII to another state entity or contractor performing a function of the program unless disclosure is necessary for administration of the program, complies with the prohibition on disclosure of PII under 20 VSA 4651, and that prohibits uh, release by um, the state of PII to the federal government for creation of registries. It does not prohibit uh, the release of PII for the purpose of grant assistance 
which is actually something that the federal government prohibits states and local governments from doing. Um, and then it complies with all applicable requirements of 9 VSA Chapter 62, which is the protection of personally identifiable information um, chapter of law. Uh, then you get to section two, which is the appropriation. There is a, um, a placeholder for the amount to be appropriated in fiscal year 2021 from the general fund to AHS for use in fiscal year 21 for administration and payment of grants pursuant to the coronavirus release, the relief assistance program for immigrants. And then there's also a placeholder in there for um, an amount to be used for administration of the program. Uh, basically what the state would pay the contractor to administer the program. And then the bill would take effect on passage. So Teresa, um, what I would ask for so I can see the whole committee, um, this is really a blend of uh, some of our discussions, some of the work that Mike had done with Senate Agriculture a few months ago, and also with the proposal that the administration has put on the table. So this is simply a draft that we need to uh, clean up and um, adjust and to, and to make our own. And so my first question is, th does any committee member have a general question? And then we will go through by section so that we're not jumping all over the bill with questions. But is there an overall or general question that, that anyone has for uh, legislative council? Mary? Uh, thank you. My recollection, and it's not a good one, is that when we were trying to do the driver uh, uh, privilege cards, that there was some transfer of information either by, and, and again, it's recollection, that I don't know that the data was transferred, but employees were perhaps telling law enforcement about someone who came to request this. I, I think I heard you saying we're mirroring some of the, what we were doing there. How can we assure that an individual is not identified to law enforcement through the processes we've set up? So we're marrying, we're marrying or we're using the definition of resident from the driver's privilege card. But uh, what is different is that there's that subsection that is specific about keeping that information confidential, not disclosing it, and not disclosing it to the federal government for creation of a registry. There is a federal law that prohibits states and local governments from having laws that prohibit disclosure of immigration status information to the federal government when the state is applying for a grant or other assistance. So that is the reference to 9 VSA 4651. In 9 VSA 4651, it says that, that um, personally identifiable information shall uh, basically not be knowingly disclosed to any federal agency or official for the purpose of registration of an individual based on his or her personally identifying information. So as I noted earlier, immigration status is part of PII. So the state cannot knowingly disclose that PII to a federal agency for purposes of a registration. However, the section goes on to say, nothing in the section is intended to prohibit or impede any public agency from complying with the lawful requirements of 8 USA 1373 and 1644. And those two sections prohibit states from, hold on, this is 1373. Uh, notwithstanding any other provision of federal, state, or local law, a federal, state, or local governmental entity or official may not prohibit or in any way restrict any government entity or official from sending to or receiving from INS information regarding the citizenship or immigration status lawful or unlawful of any individual. So if INS requests um, 
they will look to see if the state has a law that has a prohibition on it. And that really comes into play when there's funding programs. Um, there's been some significant litigation around the country where the, the presidential administration, federal administration has limited um, awards or has required disclosure of immigration status as part of an application for assistance. Um, or in some cases, when the state has applied, has um, limited the award or prohibited the award to the state if the state has a law on its books that prohibits sharing of information with the federal government. Um, I think our state has navigated that well. Um, we say we don't provide PII to the federal government for creation of a, for a registry, but we do not um, say that we're not gonna provide information under the, um, under uh, 1373 and 1644. Uh, and we as a state can say under our state law that information is confidential and shall not be disclosed. Um, so I think this navigates that well. Will you have people that don't understand this restriction and think that they have the right to disclose the information like the DMV law enforcement officers did potentially. And I, I don't know if you can do anything about that. Um, the, those officers were pro likely working or providing that information outside their authority. Thank, thank you, Mike. I'm gonna have to contemplate this, but okay. that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, another broad question before we go into the sections, Marty. I just noted and I want people to keep in mind as we go through this that so far there is no discussion of timing of payments to go out the door or the type of a payment that would go out the door. So whether we want to specify that later on or not, I don't know, but I just wanted to point that out. Thanks. Okay. So, so Becky told me you discussed that yesterday, things like application date and termination of the program. I didn't have any, I didn't have any instruction or, or detail on when and what, so I didn't want to presume anything. And so it's not included in there. She also said you wanted to include a reversion of the funds. And um, I have some concerns about that on a timing level. She said you wanted the funds to revert in early spring. And because this bill probably won't get enacted for a few more weeks, and then AHS or whomever the agency is needs to contract with a contractor. And then the contractor needs to stand up the program. So optimistically, that's middle of November. Realistically, it's probably January. Um, and then you have a population that might at first be anxious or cautious about approaching um, an application or approaching the entity that is providing the assistance. So the program might start off slow. If you're gonna have the reversion in early spring, whatever early spring is, April, you're, you're really kind of limiting the time frame for when the program's gonna operate. And maybe that's okay. Maybe ultimately there's gonna be enough demand on this, but I, I just wanted to put that out there as a timing concern if there's reversion in early spring it, it may it may put a, a restriction on the program uh, thank you mike we're hoping to get some guidance on um on um you know groups that are working with the individuals that have been left behind to uh, to understand what the timing needs to be and um and also um uh, I lost track of the other thing I was going to say, <clears throat> uh, but but I, I'm, we're 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 hoping for some guidance um, with with um, so that we can make an informed decision. Uh, Chip, a broad question. Uh, well, just to follow up on this, um, uh, <clears throat> just to say that yes, we we did have those discussions. Um, I was uh, asked to 
to converse with Susanna Davis about those specific, specifically about those questions and get her input, um, which should, I, I would hope coming back today. I would just ask um, Mike, if you're willing, um, if you, it just in your experience, not to make recommendations to the committee, but in your experience, if you um, could just write me a, a memo, just say, you know, like you said, standing up the program is, you know, optimistically in November, more likely January, just that kind of thing. And about um, if you have any thoughts about the, the timing of uptake of this program, just based on your experience, just I would love to have that so that we have um, legislative council's experience um, with those kinds of timing issues as well to consider when we're making the decision. Well, I think you have uh, a, a wealth of, of good examples from the CRF bills that just went out. Um, my experience is with the Agency of Agriculture. You, you passed that CRF bill, the Ag CRF bill in, in late ju June. They just stood up the program that they implemented with a contractor about 14, 15 days ago. And they're estimating that it's going to take three to four weeks to process applications that re they receive in order to ensure that, that the, that they're doing their due diligence. So, um, you know, you, it took them two months to set up the program and it takes them three weeks to process an application. So you, you I think that's a, a pretty good um, framework or example of, of what it's gonna take to set up this program. Thank you. Thank you, Chip, thank you, Mike. And my other question was when, when we're walking through this, um, you know, whether or not, you know, we have to contract with a third party or whether we have entities um, uh, aid in, in getting the applications and filling the applications out, but maybe the, the process could be done in-house uh, within whatever agency or department we choose. So that's something that I wanna learn more about. If there are agencies that are more capable of, of doing this in-house with, you know, with the help of these, um, with the help of in, you know, independent groups to, to reach out into the communities and assist with the application process. Um, so I have down that you know, outstanding, we're going to work on the timing, you know, any deadlines, types of payments, when the reversion of funds should happen and, and those pieces. Now let's uh, walk through um, the bill. Mary, do you have a, qu a question? You're muted. Sorry. Didn't we also have a conversation about whether we wanted to um, hold separate within the amount of money we're allocating funds for children, that we wanted to make sure we funded children completely um, in, in, I don't think we, Y'all are kind of nodding like you recall. Yeah. I'm not expressing this, but I think that's an issue that we need to talk about. Susanna Davis did bring up that uh, 500,000 be set aside of the total mm -hmm. address to children. And if it wasn't used, then that would fall to the Go bottom. Back into, if it wasn't yeah. used there, then it would fall to whatever reversion piece. Mm -hmm. So I'll put that down, um, you know, the, the, the children uh, exclusion, you know, to address mm -hmm. first. Thank but I you. think it was 500,000. Yes. Uh, Maida? And at whatever, is the appropriate moment I get, is there room for us to discuss what the, the total bottom line is here? Uh, yep, when we get to that number in the bill, we'll do it. That would be a Thanks. talk about what we're thinking. Um, uh, and then Nolan is here to keep the fiscal note fresh in our minds. Thank you. So, uh, Teresa, let's put the bill back up if we can. And I hope I can still see hands because my printer doesn't work and I didn't get a copy and I can't read it on my cell phone. Um, so um, in the first section, obviously, uh, there, let's, let's go down to the definitions. Um, you went to, um, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, are there any questions here regarding uh, the definitions that we need to ask Mike? I mean, there's lots of things our committee will um, 
need to decide, but are there any questions on the definition? Katie, I do have one question. Okay, Peter, I don't, just didn't see your hand. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Um, so Mike, this is um, regarding eligible adult. It's both here. It's also on page three, line eight. Um, is eligible to receive economic impact payments under the CARES Act. Uh, should it be was or did receive instead of is? Because is implies future. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a good question. I used is because I think some of these programs are still viable. Um, and, and definitely the state programs that are funded through CRF funds are still viable until December 30th and potentially further if Congress extends that deadline. Um, but the intent of, of us doing this is to match people um, that were not eligible to receive the, the stimulus payment check that came in March, April uh, to, to that check like the rest of us receive. So that's the right. reason why I'm asking is versus was. Um, so I, I thought it was not just the stimulus, but it was also things such as the additional unemployment insurance, um, PPP, uh, those other programs uh, that our CARES Act authorized that do provide economic impact payments. Um, if well, that, you that wanted... Is that has not been my understanding. This we we discussed the stimulus checks that everyone received March April timeframe, uh, and and a you know little more fair and equitable um, distribution of that money. So if that's what you want, I can revise that language to be clear as to um, the economic stimulus payments under the CARES Act. Who who was ineligible to receive those? If that's what you would like. I think that's up to the committee overall, but that's, that's, that's my understanding. Um, any thoughts on that from committee members before we moved on, 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 the, um, on what the focus of, of this was? Maida? Maida? I forgot to unmute. Sorry, what Peter just described, that was my understanding also, that this was with regard to the stimulus piece. Thank you, Maida. And Martin. As well, I understood it the same way that Peter described. Okay, um, so um, is that the consensus of the committee, Mary? Um, I agree that that was the language we were using and maybe that is is where we should land. I just don't know who else is not covered. And is there, if at the end of the, so one, there's the question of the equity and who was excluded from the payments, but it, I believe there is also an underlying issue of people who are in danger from their poverty, you know, from inability to earn an income and how are we supporting them? And if they are excluded from other opportunities that we're providing folks because of their immigration status, do we really want to exclude them from this? So I would have to ask Nolan if our fiscal note addresses more than the 1200 and the 500, because if um, if we're working from a fiscal note, either we have to change the fiscal note or we have to, um, if it, the intentions were working from the fiscal note, then, then that's five. So I, you know, we have to decide that. But Nolan, just very quickly, does our fiscal note address anything beyond the, 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 that stimulus equity of 1200 and 500? No, and my understanding is that's all it was addressing. That's so it only I only did the twelve and the five hundred. Okay, thank you, Nolan. Um, Mary, were you finished before I moved to Diane? Um, got it. That makes sense. Our time frame is such that we maybe can't think about these other groups. We may want to come back to this at some other point. Um, so, thank you. And uh, Diane? Great. Thank you. I think I'm, yeah. 
So I just I just have a question around if it's a clear statement for people who, are not, who were not eligible for the twelve hundred dollars stimulus that was before. Um, we'd have to make sure that we include it due to the reasons of immigration status or whatever that the that defining piece is because I do believe that people were not eligible for that twelve hundred dollar stimulus because they uh, were their income was above a particular amount, right? And I, so I just wanted to be careful that we didn't open the door here for, oh, I wasn't eligible for the federal stimulus because I make a half a million dollars a year. So I would be eligible here. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And, and is that covered here, Mike, that it doesn't open the door to you know, every Vermonter um, who didn't qualify for the original stimulus because they're, they're, um, you know, because of their uh, their economic situation. Uh, it, it's you're only eligible if you were ineligible for CARES Act due to immigration status. So people that had uh, who were disqualified due to income or or who were disqualified be, because they were, um, you know, a 20 year old dependent uh, of a of a um, an ineligible person. Uh, they, they they would not qualify for this award. So it doesn't it doesn't blow the door wide open for. No, it does it does not. Um, Diane, are you all set then with your question? Sorry, I turned myself off already. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, okay. um, Marty, and then Maida. I just quickly reviewed the documents we received yesterday, the fact sheet, and also the Susanna Davis document. And both of those say specifically that it's for people who are excluded from the economic stimulus payments due to their or someone else's immigration status. So uh, number one, I think we need to confine it to the economic stimulus program, the $1,200 program, but whether we say their own immigration status or include also as well someone else's immigration status, that might help clarify things. Right, so it doesn't say their immigration status, it says due to immigration status. So that- Okay, that, I see that now. Okay, and, and that was intentional because as Nolan's fiscal note points out, there's, there's different categories of people who are, were, were ineligible due to immigration status. And some it's because um, you know, you, you're married to a person uh, that is ineligible. And so th there's going to be some um, implementation that the contractor, or whomever implements this program, will have to work through in, in defining who those people are that are, were ineligible due to immigration status. I'm fine. Question answered, Marty. Yes, but I do think we want to specify that it's related to the specific federal program that had the $1,200 last April. And um, so, um, so when it, uh, with the committee now, with the fiscal note we're working on, um, are, is the committee in agreement that we, um, that the, the, the job set before us at this, at this point um, is to address the, this, the inequity in the $1,200 and the $500, and, and um, that is our focus. So I, I just would like um, to know if anyone um, feels that, it, we, it, it, that the conversation was different than that. Okay, so as we move forward, our focus is on the $1,200 and $500. Is there an there agreement with the committee on that? Uh, I'd just like to see, I, I don't have a whole screen, so I can't really see individuals. Uh, there we go. Okay, uh, if we're in agreement that we're moving forth on the 1,200 and 500, a hands up would be great. And I see, okay, uh, then I, I, that's, where, that's where we're headed. So yay, we took one thing off the table. Uh, let's go back to the language and I think we can move to the next section. Uh, Teresa, can you pop the language back up, please? I apologize. I need to get a printer that works. They have a mind of their own. And so the next piece, Mike, that we move to, if there's no other questions on the definitions, 
I, I think I, I would recommend that you look at the definition of resident of Vermont to make sure that that's what you want. Uh, yep. So where, what page is that on? I need to. That, that is on page two, um, beginning at the oh, bottom of the page. Before we get there, were there any questions on, uh, I did, can you explain to me, Mike, um, go back up a little bit, Teresa, in the, uh, in the, in the address, the name address, those, those identification factors, can you identify, can you explain more to number, uh, letter E to me, please? Letter E? Yeah. No, um, no. F, 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 F. I'm sorry, F. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. This, this one uh, uh, often comes up. Um, if uh, your DNA has been taken, um, if your blood has been taken, um, if uh, your fingerprints, uh, eye scan, uh, those, those biometric data that might be collected um, in order to be eligible for a program, uh, for instance, um, I had to give my thumbprint in order to be uh, licensed as a liar. Um, so, so that type of information is is pers is protected, personally identifiable information. Okay, it's protected then. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dave. Did you have a question on this section? I did. Actually, um, it, it's the page above. Please, if you could just go back. I, I was trying to raise my hand, but I wasn't quick enough. Um, a question on, stop right there, please. Um, uh, line 18 on the page, number three, eligible child means an individual under 18 years of age for whom an eligible adult is a parent or legal guardian. Does that mean if I'm in, the, in this country uh, with my, my sister's child um, and I'm not their parent and I'm not their legal guardian, I would not be able to, that child would not uh, be eligible for any financial assistance. And I, my concern is that there, that might be a strong likelihood. To address that? Um, it's, it's I, I'm, I'm guessing many of the folks in this, go ahead. Uh, you know, it, it's drafted that way because for purposes of, of proof. Uh, of documentation uh, for the applicant. Um, if you want it to be different, I can try to work on that. Well, I don't know about what the committee feels. I, maybe um, uh, we could get advice. Uh, if it's common, um, I think I think it's a uh, concern to me. Um, I guess. We're not in the business of dealing with anomalies, but we're trying to do social justice here, and it would be not justice uh, to exclude somebody. Could I think on it a little more, Madam Chair? And yes, maybe yes. I, I can learn if others have a similar concern. Th and, thank you. And, um, and, then, and, um, and then if you could scroll down. Our executive director of um, uh, racial equity may be able to shed a light on um, you know, the, the numbers, if yes. that's you. Okay. Thank you. That's what I'm hoping. And then, and then if we could scroll down, and this may seem like a fool's question, can stop there, please. Um, uh, letter E, immigration status. I'm worried that that will be a deterrent to people. If I'm undocumented, I don't have a green card, what have you. Is there a way to, is that necessary? It may seem obvious that it is, but Michael, have you, is there a way to, uh, my, my concern, it will be, uh, it could be a deterrent to seeking assistance if I have to tell you what it is. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, that, that, remember the, the eligible adult is only eligible because of their immigration status. So uh, there will need to be either an attestation um, which is part of the application or some other proof required by the agency implementing or the contractor implementing. But remember, this is the protection. This list is the information that's protected um, and is confidential and is not supposed to be disclosed. 
So, so this is the list of protected information. Um, you know, they will have to collect the person's name address. Um, they're going to have to collect date of birth for mm -hmm. children, et cetera. Um, that's all going to be protected. Uh, and I... Michael, what if it just said... Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt it. That's okay. Said, Are you an immigrant? Um... Uh, uh, the law may not, not say that, but the well, I think the question would have to be, are you an immigrant that was ineligible to receive assistance under the CARES Act? Um, and I don't, I don't want to hold I just wanted to raise this. Thank you. Yep. So let's, um, let's, let's keep that in discussion. Um, uh, Dave and um, Chip, if you write that down, uh, if that should be reworded or you know, how it should be written and, and how it will be used. Okay, um, let's, can, can we continue, Dave? And we know that that's on the radar for, for uh, continued Thank discussion. You. Thank you very much. I'm going to lower my hand. Thank you. Oh, it's already lowered. Okay, Mike, can, can we continue? I think the next section uh, brings us uh, to five. And right, I think. Uh, I'm sorry. If, this is the the issue that I raised when I walked through. Do you want it to just be the kind of um, general definition of resident of Vermont, someone who's domiciled in the state? Uh, and domicile means they intend to make it their home, um, primary place of residency. Uh, or do you want to have some limitations on it? Uh, and to specifically exclude those people who are in the state for a temporary period, such as students, um, migrant workers, uh, and you know, people here on a, a durational contract. Um, so that, that's, that's really the question. If you ha leave it general, you could, the, the agency or the contractor likely would have authority to interpret what domicile means. Uh, and they could, because they have the ability under the language to set guidelines and requirements, they potentially could set their own guidelines or requirements for what it means to be domiciled in the state. So it's really a question of whether or not you want to be clear in the bill or if you're intending for the agency or the contractor to, to determine what domicile is. Uh, Chip, do you have a question? Uh, really just a statement that I, um, I prefer to have it um, as, as clear and specific as we can in the bill. I mean, I think this uh, has a couple of recommendations for it. One is that it, um, as I understood Mike to say, it was, we use it elsewhere, so it's a it's a definition that we're that we know of and are are familiar with. Um, and but I think it's also clear that it it addresses the people that we are thinking about when we think about this, not people who are here um, sort of temporarily who don't intend to um, sort of be residents for the purpose of of living or making a living here, but are, are here for. Um, well, I shouldn't say it that way, but but are here for a temporary sort of defined period of time for a specific purpose um, I, I don't think you know and the, and the examples that um, that are in there about a, um, a migrant farm worker or a student or those are not the people that we I think um, are wanting to capture when we're talking about who should get a stimulus um, equity payment so I I'm, I like this definition. Uh, Diane? Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, so uh, thank you, Katie. The question that I have is really, I think, for Nolan, like what was used in determining the fiscal note for the numbers? You, I just want to make sure that um, that we don't, if, if, it's, if they've used a tighter definition or a broader definition, 
I just want to make sure that because how we define this will impact the, the fiscal note. Nolan, are you available? Yeah, I'm, I'm right here. Um, I mean, I relied on the numbers that were provided to me and vetted, and I vetted them from and the stuff that uh, Migrant Justice, UVM, Extension, and Susanna Davis, and they looked at the population that they thought would be impacted, you know, which is mostly undocumented adults, people with legal permanent residence, uh, folks who have lawful status, but no social security number. Um, so that's kind of, it wasn't looking at, um, it was sort of a broader, um, I think it was more of a broader understanding of who are the people that had not received payments who, uh, based on the proposal, felt uh, the administration felt were should be getting. Them. So I guess that I don't know how to answer your question in terms of this. That's, so, that's, no, that's no, the pay no. Nolan. But Chip, that would be something that would be keeping in mind how we define that as you work with the the groups and the entities of what they thought was the intent here. Um, Nolan, may I ask a couple of questions of you that, that are on this topic, just for clarification. Does your fiscal note include students and seasonal workers and uh, people under contracts that are here for a short period? Um, I believe it, count, it counts people who are residents. I, I would have to touch base with other folks. I, think, I don't think it does. I think it's the okay. people our residents, people of legal permanent status. Um, but let me get back to you on that. Um, okay. What I also just to remind is that the numbers are, you know, even even if we tighten the definitions or expand the definitions, these numbers are guesstimates to begin with. So it's hard to know how much that would or wouldn't impact the actual um, estimates. But I'll, I'll look into finding out more information. Thank you, Nola. Uh Diane, are you, may I move to? Um, I'm done. That was it. Meta, Meta, then you're next, please. Okay. Thank, thank you. So, I'm looking to understand if the language, as it's appearing in the draft, does or does not include the folks that are working on our dairy farms. It includes, uh, but I'm not going to answer that. I want Mike O'Grady to answer that. Uh, it does include those persons. Uh, um, and most of them are here for uh, years, if not longer, um, and have made the state their domicile um, because it is their primary place of residency. Thank you. I was just looking for that reassurance. Thank you, Meta And uh, Mary? Thank you. I'm trying to understand this also. Um, when I moved here 40 years ago, I said I am moving here for five years. So it was for a definite period of time. And I'm guessing that there are populations of people who said, oh, no, I'm just going to be there for a bit, then I'm going home. That first sentence by seems to mean they would not be included. Can you help me understand how they would be included? So um, you, you've hit upon a curious aspect of domicile slash residency. Um, it's largely about your intent. Um, and, and if you intended to move to the state and make it your primary place of residency for five years, you would qualify as a resident of Vermont. Um, but if you're moving here and you're only going, and you know that you're only gonna be working here and the only reason you are here is to work here for eight months or nine months um, or something of that, and it is never intended to be your primary place of residency, then you would not qualify. Um, it's, 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 um, it's not, a black and white um, determination. It, it, it really does apply or rely on the intent of the individual. Um, and that's why it says it's the person who intends to make the state 
his or her principal place of domicile either permanently or for an indefinite number of years. Um, so I, I don't know if I answered that question to your satisfaction, uh, but it is, it is a curious aspect of residence, residency okay. slash domicile. And as you described it, is that the way case law has tended to look at it? Yes, yes. It is about your intent. And that's, okay. that's basically uh, what case law has said. Because, so my intent was to live here for five years. That feels like a very definite period of time that on the plain reading of this says no. Um, yeah, but you could also interpret it that you were you, that you were intended to be here for an indefinite number of years, and, or that this was your principal place of domicile. I I, I understand your question. Yeah. I I if you want to work with that or, or try to refine that language, I can do that. This is based on the driver's privilege card and and under the motor vehicle law. Let me. Ponder. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dave. Dave? I know we have a delay. I think Dave's. Um, uh, it was, it was muted worse than a delay. My apology. Um, uh, I'm a migrant worker employed in a seasonal occupation. My intent though, is if things work out, is to stay here for a long time. Um, could you come in, and Michael, you may not be the person, to, but to the contractor or the, the organization who gets the grant to operationalize this, there may be frequently asked questions. And could it say, when a person is a migrant worker whose intent is to stay here for duration, they're eligible. Would that be in compliance with this law because it's their intent stated up above in line 17, yet in number 20 that says they're prohibited? Would they be eligible? I'm a um, migrant worker, but I do want to stay. Well, um, so most of the migrant workers that are here seasonally are, are here on a visa. Um, H2A, et cetera. And so th they are supposed to return to their home country at the end of the, at the expiration of the visa. So if I'm a contractor and I see the language that's in the bill currently, one of my questions might be, are you here on an H2A visa or are you here on a, on a, seasonal visa or on a visa that's limited in time or duration. To, to me, that would be a disqualifying aspect um, for that person, even if they said that they intended to stay past their visa. Um, so, uh, because they would be living in the state for a particular purpose involving a defined period of time. And I could prove so that in the application would process. Be, would be um, um, well, I, generally, ch children don't come with you on an H-2A visa. Okay. Um, I'll learn more about how our migrant workers are compensated. But thank you. I'll, I'll uh, think about this more. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so I think um, we will continue our discussion with resident and um, and those in, uh, included. I have, I'm sorry, I have Chip us next. Chip, and then we'll, um, if no other questions, we'll move to the next section. Okay, I, I mean, I, I wanted to just kind of weigh in on this discussion, but if you think if we're going to do it no, later. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, Mike, I, I need to know Mike O'Grady's, um, what, what, what is your time frame, Mike, because I don't want to hold you. 
Well, I was supposed to be gone at 9.45, but my uh, next committee changed me to 10.30. So I am here until, you know, 10.20. Okay. So we can hear Chip's um, statement and then we'll move on to the next section. Mike, you're good with that? Yep. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, to me, it makes sense to use a definition that we know works to cover the the, the sorts of people that we, um, I think, well, that I'm thinking about, and I think many of the committee members are thinking about. I worry that if we try to sweep in, if we try to create a new definition that sweeps in everybody that we can think of um, explicitly, that we're going to um, potentially open this in a way that um, will mean that we won't be able to provide the, the um, full you know, equity, $1,200 and $500 payments to the people who we want to participate in this program. I, I think Mike has, I heard him say that this definition um, has been, the case law indicates that people who come here with the intent to be here for, um, for a purpose to, to live here, to domicile here, um, whether they come with, with the intention of a very specific number of years, five years, for example, um, or an indefinite idea um, would be considered residents um, under this definition. Um, you know, I think of a college graduate from, you know, Boston who says, I'm gonna go work in, in, uh, at Ben and Jerry's for five years um, and then I think I'm going to move out to uh, Colorado. We would consider that person uh, a Vermonter, a resident, while they're here. I mean, they, they came here with the intent of, of being here for a period of, of living here, of participating as a Vermonter. And, and I don't think um, anything in this definition um, makes that different for, for someone, an uh, uh, undocumented farm worker who comes to Vermont with the idea that he's going to, um, he or she is going to work on a dairy farm here to make money uh, for a period of years, you know, whatever they have in mind, and then go may perhaps go back to their own their own country that or their original country. Um, that that seems that they would I as I read this, they would qualify as a resident of Vermont under that circumstance, and that I think is largely who we're trying to um, capture. I, I just want us to be careful not to in our attempt to serve everyone that we can think of um, risk opening this up in a way that means that we aren't serving uh, the people that that uh, we want to serve as fully as we'd like to serve them. Thank you, Chip. I want to remind the committee if when we start uh, building new definitions, we're going to need to take more testimony and this bill will probably go to a policy committee and not remain in our committee. Um, and it would become a January issue at that point. And it's not, I'm not intending that for to sway anyone's um, opinion on what the bill needs to say. I'm just putting the realities out there that we appropriate money and we rely on uh, policy from the committees of jurisdiction. And, and so uh, we're walking a bit of a fine line, but right now we are walking with a proposal that is in our budget and 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 trying to um, address those points as we see fit. So we can take this in a whole other direction, and we have absolutely, you know, the ability and the authority to do that. Um, but it would mean going to a, another committee, and I'm not using that as a threat, um, just as reality. Uh, Runda, I think you have a question. No, I. I was going to I was going to agree with with Chip. I mean, I am agreeing with Chip. And then I took my hand down because I thought, well, no adding to it. But I really feel that we have to be. There's a line we have to follow that says we want people who are living here for a period of time who are working on our farms. We're talking about our dairy farmers. And once we start talking about you know, the people who are living down the street from me at a farmer's market where they have these fields and they're just in for 
a few months. That's not who I'm thinking of in terms of qualifying for this. So I'm thinking about those people who are here, especially those with children who are living here over a period of time. And um, that's, so I basically agree with what Chip is saying. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Okay, Mike, I think we're ready to move to the next section. Okay. Um, next number. I, I just want to mention while you were discussing that, I went to California's program to see what they did. They just said that the person has to be a resident of the county where they are applying. They don't provide a definition. Um, so it, 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 it is... It is again based on residency and that that general concept. California has already passed a bill similar to this. Yes. Oh they my. Have a pro okay. Thank you. California and New Jersey. The California program is a private public partnership. The New Jersey program was initially vetoed and then reenacted, and I think right now it's basically using private funds. But um, I can confirm that for you. Okay. Uh, let's move to, um, we're past resident, Teresa, let's move down to um, establishment of the program. And Mike has already walked through all of these pieces, and this is the, the program that, that we agreed upon when we, when we took um, a raise of hands that we would, it's to um, address those Vermonters left behind under the the federal stimulus, it's the 1200, the 500. And so I think that we have um, addressed this piece, but the administration of the program, we have not addressed. And I don't see any questions from committee members on this piece. So can we walk down to the administration, now, Teresa, please? Okay, are there any, we're, we're going to have a lot of discussion, Mike, with you um, later about how we're going to administer this program and um, whether, you know, what agency or department we use. And I think that we will have some guidance from um, the, um, the position that we set up, the executive director of, of um, uh, racial equity. Um, Marty has a question and I think, uh, and then Chip. I'm concerned about that word shall that Michael pointed out on line 16, that whoever we ask to do it, they shall partner with someone else. Um, and then it says as needed. So I guess I don't understand. Either they well, shall do it and go ahead well, there's two, or there's two not people. necessarily. Um, we heard yesterday from Susanna Davis and I asked her, um, if she wanted to, to be part of overseeing this program. And so that shell would mean that whoever we choose would work directly with the executive director of racial equity, who would be at this time, Susanna Davis. And then to partner with, um, um, that they will, con you know, they shall partner with others as needed, you know, if she feels that migrant justice needs to come in or other groups need to come in to weigh in. Um, that they that they shall part would partner with them if, if the need arises. I, I, that's how I am reading that, Mike. Am I? That, that's that's why it's drafted that way. For instance, say that there's a need for outreach or there's a need for um, translation assistance in the application process, then the they shall do that um, because the need has arisen. Marty, do you have another question? Okay, I, I just would think, I would just think May would be more appropriate, but. Um, I, th I think that, that that's, that's, that's a policy decision. I think, um, I think that's up to you. If, if you want to give that, that entity a little bit of flexibility, um, I think sh shifting it from child to May would do that. Okay, so we'll come back to um, to line 14, number one, uh, with the shall may issue. Um, so that's a committee discussion that we can have. And then uh, let's continue down, Teresa. Are there any other questions? Chip, did you have your hand up here? Yes, you did, I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, 
So Mike, um, I think I know the answer, but I'll just let you say it. Um, uh, on number two, um, the agency shall not be required to initiate rulemaking. The reason for that? Uh, timing. Uh, it, it generally takes five to eight months to work through all the APA uh, timing requirements. And I, I think you'd be beyond the time frame for when you want this program to operate. That's what I thought. Just wanted you to confirm it. Thank you. And Linda? Linda, are you there? You might be muted. Just, I keep up, I keep, I keep unmuting and it, my, my machine keeps muting me. So it's telling me not to talk. Anyway, you know, having served on the rules committee for, you know, forever, for a hundred years or more, um, and understanding how many times we have to delay uh, an issue, a rule, because something didn't get done right or something like that. Just to me, I was really pleased to see the fact that, that we would not have to go through rules for this. So that's my opinion on it. So. Thank, Thank you, Linda. You. Thank you. All right, Teresa, let's move down onto page four, please, further down. And I think the next piece is um, uh, this is where we have with, you know, the agency or whatever we choose to do. We'll work through all of these pieces of, of uh, you know, if, if they can go out to a third party, if it stays in house, if, if they have the jurisdiction. Uh, we have the bulletin 3.5 around the, the sole sourcing because if they do go out, the, the time constraints. Um, and so um, it, it handles that issue uh, when we're in an emergency situation. And um, I'm just looking to see if there's uh, the confidentiality piece and the contracts. So are there any questions on any of these pieces? I think that those will all be committee discussion, but I, I, are there a clarification that we need to ask anyone has for Mike? I'm not seeing any clear. Can we go to the next page, Teresa? I just uh, have one, Kitty. I'm sorry, I'm not quick enough. Had Diane? So, um, on the contract with, with this entity, would, what is the report back? What is their responsibility for reporting back what they've, done and and provide it um oh go ahead mike i was going to say that's so, something we can write in but go ahead mike sure so uh i um you're you're still going to be subject to the administrative bulletins so you're still still going to be subject uh if the agency is going to issue it as a grant to the contractor for subsequent award to eligible applicants then it's subject to the, the grant uh, reporting requirements. If they're going to do it as a contract um, with the contractor, then it's subject to the contract provisions of the administrative bulletin, what is it, five. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you have those reporting requirements built in to either um, avenue that the agency would take in pushing the money out to the contractors. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, Marty and then Mary. Oops, sorry. There? Yes, yeah, uh, this is Marty. I, I, we, Linda brought up yesterday, and I think a very important point, that any payments that go out the door should come from the state of Vermont, not from migrant justice, as an example. In section two here, line 14 and 15, does that preclude working with migrant justice as an example to find people who, and to do the outreach and to find out who's eligible. But then I, frankly, I would like to see the check that goes out the door to come from the state of Vermont, as opposed to from an organization such as migrant justice. Can that happen in item number two here? Uh, I think I can do that for you. Um, uh, for example, in one of the ag assistance, CRF ag assistance programs, it was VITA that was administering, but the check was being issued by the state of Vermont. Uh, so okay. that could be- Thank that you, could that's be an important point to me. 
Is that a longer discussion with committee members or are committee members comfortable that even if we work with an outside source like VITA, um, that the check can still come from the state of Vermont? I just, I only have a question on the, does that slow it down or pose an issue if it comes from the state versus your ability to have to report back if that, that would be my only real concern is if it gets slowed down. Uh, it, it takes time for the state to cut the check to, to review the request for the check and to cut it, yes. Okay. So um, any other questions from um, members on this topic? Is Mary, is yours on this topic about the check coming from the state? Um, I'm just going to put that down and as we, give, as we make decisions, Mike can make these changes. Is that one we're ready to make now or, or would you like to hold it until we have a package? Uh, not here. Mary? If it takes time, it's okay if it's a day or two. If it is a month, then I'm concerned. So... I'm not I don't think sure it's. I'm, uh, yeah. I don't think it's a month, and I, I can check with some of the agencies that are that are running um, programs like this. I think it's it's a, a couple of days. It's not just a day. It, mm -hmm. um, it's a couple of days, uh, probably up to five. Th that seems reasonable, and I would be comfortable with saying yes. The check has to come from the state. If it's more than that, so to your question, Chair, I, it, if it's a long period of time, no, I'm not comfortable. If it's a short period, I am. Okay, Mike, you'll come back. With you Could you get us that information? And uh, that will determine the direction we go. I'm not seeing from anyone else except Peter has a question at, on this topic. Just a comment. Um, one of the things I talked about yesterday was building trust. And I think that, that uh, um, to have the funds, we, if we distribute the funds to a, a NGO, uh, migrant justice or someone else, and then they distribute, uh, and it has no, mm -hmm. there's nothing on there that says from the state of Vermont or, mm -hmm. or it's a check from the state of Vermont, we're not building that trust between the state and, and, and our individuals that are, that are frankly feeding us and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, helping us. So, um, to, to do the check directly from the state, I think is important. It is a small piece in building trust, which takes a very long time. And providing it takes up to a week, I'm okay. Uh, Dave, thank you, Peter. Dave? Dave, I think you have- uh, Sorry. A or um, mute. There you are. I'm, yeah. I think it can work. My concern was that some of these folks may not have workable mailing addresses in which things can be mailed to. Uh, but I think they could say, uh, mail it to of the Migrant Justice Program on Church Street in Burlington. And then I would go there and pick up the check. I think it could be done with a workaround. Um, I, I'll talk to the uh, Susanna about whether uh, uh, that's an issue. A lot of folks don't really have addresses the way we do, um, that they can use reliably. Um, and if, uh, anyway, so it was in the back of my mind. Not a, I'm, I'm happy to go with the state issuing it, but I, I do wanna look a little deeper quickly into that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, and uh, you'll get back to us. So uh, Mike, you'll look at the timing and uh, Dave does have a, qu a question about addresses, but that's different than coming from the state. Um, let's move down. Mary, did you have another question or was your, oh, you were, you're good? Okay, let's go down to the next section. Uh, we have the confidentiality that, that Mike went through uh, to quite an extent. Mary had some good questions overall earlier. And um, were there any other questions on confidentiality that Mike did not cover earlier? Then Teresa, let's continue down. And, um, we're just on page five. My goodness, it seems like we've gone through pages. Um, so Mike, is there anything, uh, any questions here from committee members um, 
uh, this is all about uh, confidentiality still, Mike. Am I correct? Yes. Yep. So, so subsection E is about confidentiality under the State Public Records Act. Subsection F is about um, ensuring that anyone that's implementing the program doesn't disclose personally identifiable information. They're, they're similar, but slightly different. And so I wanted mm -hmm. to treat them as two different subsections. And I think you spoke to both of those uh, in an example of what happened earlier within DMV. Yep. Um, so let's uh, continue down, Teresa, because I think we've covered those. And finally, we have uh, the appropriation piece, and then the other piece was uh, for the administration use, which that you know could be an X as well. But we're working off. Uh, this was put together with several different bills, and so um, our appropriation, um, the proposal from the administration that the governor put on the table was two million dollars to do the program, which is the twelve hundred and five hundred dollar program, which our committee has agreed upon. Um, the fiscal note was a range from, I believe it was 4.4 to 5.3. Um, knowing we have some work to do with money, are there some thoughts from committee members about what we would like to think um, of what this, uh, an appropriate um, number would be to do this? And I have Maida's hand up and I think that's my only hand right now. Oh, th thank you. Um, I'd like to put on the table um, $3 million. Uh, that's a million more than has been put into the budget by the, the administration. The, the reason I'm wanting to, us to at least discuss this is that we have seen through the fiscal note as well as the testimony from our um, racial equity executive director, that the real cost of this potentially might be over uh, $5 million. Um, knowing we don't have money to, to, uh, to, to just apply where we might want to, um, that, that's why I'm, I'm putting out there for discussion to just raise it a, a, a million because it would seem to me that there's virtually no question that more than 2 million will be needed. And if perchance it's not, then swept back to the general fund. So Maida, I, I think what I, I'm trying to follow what you're saying, the governor has 2 million on the table. You're saying that we add a million more to the 2 million for a, a total from 3 million at our end to get to a five total. Is no, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm saying three, three, no. mil, three million total. Three million total. Okay. And are there other thoughts on that? Uh, uh, well, Mary uh, is, has her hand up and then Diane. Well, I had been hoping that we could at least have the conversation around bringing it to a total of five, given that that's the identified need. Um, I certainly understand the pressing needs elsewhere in the budget, but I, I would like us to try to stretch ourselves to, to find the, a total of five. Okay, Mary. Um, and Diane, I think your hand is up. Thank, thank you. Um, I would, I mean, we've seen the fiscal note. I don't know if that's, that's, it hasn't changed. I mean, I would like to see us be able to to fund it to the point where we've we've done it appropriately for the demand, which would be somewhere in the neighborhood of five, but understanding, you know, we've got a couple of other things that we're gonna be working on in the next couple of days, right, Madam Chair, that, that may soften that number one way or the other. But I mean, I think it's in the end, if we're gonna do the program and take the fiscal note seriously, it would, we would try to get as close to if five as we can. Okay. But I don't know if I'm ready to, you know, I, we, we, we've got a couple of other decisions to make before I fill in that blank. Um, I have uh, Marty and then Chip and then Maida. Well, I agree as well that we've seen the fiscal note. We know, we think what it might cost. It would be nice if we had $5.3 million, but I guess I'm, Siding back with Meta, I don't think we have that amount of money, and and I think 
putting in three, which is more than the governor had, would be an appropriate amount simply because we don't really know what all this is going to be. But but more importantly, there are there are other, I think, just in, just as important issues that we're trying to fund with our other money. So I would tend to be a little bit on the conservative side, but I'm willing to look at more if all of a sudden we found a, a windfall of money. But I, I'm pessimistic that will happen. Thank you, Marty. Uh, Chip and then Meta. Um, so not sure quite where to begin. I, you know, so um, I, along with others, have been trying to you know look look to find whether are there are any places that we could come up with that money. Um, you know, at the end of the day, of course, it's a all of these the spending decisions um, will come before our committee, and we have to you know prioritize as we always do. Um, but if we're able to fund the money, I, I feel pretty strongly that we should fund the, the program at an amount that will allow us, as best we can determine, to, um, to, to serve all the people who would be eligible fully. I mean, this, this to me is really about taking, uh, providing equity. And I think that's what the, the governor, you know, the reason he put it in his budget um, was the recognition that that we are not treating all Vermonters the same, and that this um, proposal is an attempt um, to do that? Uh, Adam, I can't remember if it was in our committee or somewhere else that I heard him say that this um, that their proposal, their number, was a conversation starter. That they wanted to come to the legislature with this proposal, which I um, I think we all did. We're really thankful to the governor for having put on the table. Um, and it was a place to start the conversation about what we could do and how much we could do. Um, and, and, you know, the legislature is going to play its part um, in, in figuring that out. Um, I, I worry very much about if we don't fund it at a level that we think will serve the people that, um, that are eligible, how, how we determine who doesn't get a payment or how you reduce the payments. And once you begin reducing payments, then we're not talking about equity anymore. We're talking about treating a, a group of Vermonters differently than, than others. And so uh, for my part, I'm going to say, um, I really want us to um, go forward with the idea that, that we're going to put five, $5 million into this program. We believe that that will um, serve the people that, that we believe will be eligible for it. Um, and then we need to come up with the money to do that. Um, and, and, you know, the next day or two, we'll know whether we have that uh, a source for that money. And, and then we can have a discussion about whether the committee agrees um, that that is a priority in a way we want to spend it. Thank you, Chip. And uh, Maida and Peter. Thanks. Uh, for the record, I just want to say it's a rare moment when I'm the conservative one. <laughs> so mark, just mark that down, somebody who's keeping track. Um, but also I would be so happy if we can come up with $5 million or whatever the, the, the full amount is that would support this. I would be happy as can possibly be and would support it wholeheartedly. If we can find that money, um, I, I will support that. No question whatsoever. Thank you, Maida. And uh, then Chip, and I think then after we uh, need to let Peter Mike and Lady uh, go, I have I Chip. Think, I think you meant me, Kitty? Peter? Uh, no, Peter. I think Peter. And then I Thank have you. Rep. Rep must be Bob. It's just Rep Bob. <laughs> so, I guess Thank so. You, Kitty. So, Kitty, uh, you know, if we're going to do something, let's do it right. Um, and that also helps to build trust. So let's 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 allot five million dollars into this, uh, and uh, if you know if there is any money left over at the end of the year, it will be swept back at the end of the year because that's what happens at the end of the budget. Um, I think we 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 set out by do, to do this right, and uh, and we go from there. Thank you, Peter, uh, and uh, Bob. There, I have your whole name now. I know it's you. Go ahead, Bob. You, you know, 
Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, very much. And I um, want to echo what Peter just said. He, he hit the nail on the head, I thought. It, it, we've got a lot of obligations here and a lot, a lot of unknowns, and we've got a whole next year that's really unknown. So to get our cart financially ahead of our horse at this point, we're going to do that anyways, to some degree. I think we have to be very careful. We've got, I don't want to bore everybody with this, but we've got the Vermont State Colleges that is just lingering out there with major issues and costs. And I, I think we just have to be very careful. And, you know, we can follow this through as we see how money rolls in it. Money's actually coming in better than what anybody expected a little bit, but mm -hmm. we don't know how that's going to progress. It depends on the, you, you, I don't have to tell you all this, but anyways, I'm with Peter. Thank you. And, and Bob, just to be clear, Peter's position was if we're going to do this program to fully fund it, to make it work, it was to, to address the 5 million. If we can find you know, if the, if we can find those available dollars. Um, and so the available dollars needed would be an additional three because there's $2 million in the budget. So there are $2 million in the budget. <laughs> that is correct. But didn't he mention into going into next year? Not doing it all right at this point. That's what I thought no. I heard anyways. No. Do you want to clarify, please? Not yet. No, I did. I did say, you know, let's, let's a lot, let's, let's allocate. Uh, appropriate $5 million into this program, do it right. At the end of the year, if there is any left over, it will automatically get swept back unless we make some decision at that point in time that, that would do something different. Because that's what happens to the money in the budget. Yeah, I, I reverse heard him. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then uh, when we talk about, you know, the administration of the program, we can talk about no more than X amount of dollars as we did in some of the other uh, programs that came before our committee uh, percentages that could go up for any kind of administrative fee. So uh, what I would like to do now, we've been, um, we've been uh, only an hour and a half, and unless there's any questions for Mike, um, I think that Mike and Nolan may need to be in other places or prepare for other things that they have. Teresa, can we have a full screen again, please? Thank you. Um, Mary, do you have one final question? Yeah, well, and it is on this section. We had had a conversation about whether or not we were going to, of the portion of money we set aside for this program, reserve some piece of it for children. And that belongs in here. And I don't know if you would want to discuss that here or take advantage of them before they leave. Uh, sure, I had that on our list of lots of open topics, but I think that that is one that Susanna Davis brought up. And if that's something we can take off the table quickly, then let's do it. And she suggested of the $500, um, the $500 okay. payment, there's between 500 and 1,000 children, so the most it would be uh, would be the the, the five hundred thousand dollars. And her recommendation was to make sure that the children uh, were secure, and and then if that money is not all used, then it would drop to you know the the full payment going out of the 1,200, and then whatever of that that's not used is whatever construct that we bring back into the into the state. Um, so that's a proposal uh, Susanna had mentioned. Mary would uh, has put it on the table. Chip, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, well, just uh, about this. Um, so just my recollection is that she brought that up in the context of if we um, funded it at less than what we thought would fully fund the program, that that's how she would prioritize it, um, the money that we had. So at say the $2 million level, if we didn't think that would um, serve everyone, uh, that she would, her recommendation would be to try to serve the children first or to reserve a certain amount. I, I will say that um, the way the bill is constructed now, I think we'd have to re, um, rewrite it in a way um, in order to do that. I think right now the children are tied 
to the eligible adult. Um, and if it, it would take some doing to, to shift that, um, not that we can't do it, but it would, you know, we'd have to rewrite some of it. But in any so, case, my, my recollection is that her recommendation was in the context of if there wasn't enough money to serve everybody. Um, and frankly, uh, not frankly, but um, my inclination would be to not try to do that division if we can come up with the amount of money we think will fully fund the program. I, I didn't remember that. So thank you, Chip. That's an yes. excellent point. So we shouldn't have this conversation until we decide the funding level then. So back off. Any other questions for Mike or for Nolan before they leave? And Nolan did get confirmation from um, Susanna. You, you uh, asked her the question about seasonal workers. Nolan, would you like to relate that to the committee, please? Yeah, the estimate is for residents resident estimate and it does not include seasonal workers. Um, doesn't include the whole group of students, seasonal workers, and people here on contract. Correct. Thank you, Nolan. Any other questions, uh, Mike? So going back to Representative Fagan's question about um, the definition of eligible adult and the fact that uh, it references economic impact payments, I went to the Treasury, um, U.S. Treasury's uh, website to see how they're characterizing those stimulus payments. They call them economic impact payments, but they capitalize the term, which is actually what the administration did in their, in their proposal, but our drafting manual uh, lowercase them. What I'd propose is I'd I'll put in a definition of economic impact payments, which is the step stimulus payments of $1,200 to eligible adult and $500 to eligible children underneath the CARES Act. And then that will be clear that that's, that's what, um, looking at the treasury document, uh, a website, the children that were eligible under the CARES Act were 17 or younger, not, 18 or younger. Do you want to be consistent with that? They were right. under 17. Yes. They were 17 or under. So once you're 18, you're considered an adult. So it, 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 it was, they were just under 17 years old. So does that include a 17 year old or not? It, not as I read the language, no. So it's, it's, that's, this is a policy question. You don't need to be bound by that. It's whether or not you want to set it at under 18 or, or under 17. Uh, Mary and uh, Mary, your hand is up. Yeah, I, I would be very uncomfortable taking it lower than 18 as a matter of policy and other areas were driving up the age of childhood. You know, in the criminal justice area, we're talking about 21 and under. So I, I get the desire to be um, congruent with the federal program, but boy, that makes me uncomfortable to go younger than 18. Um, Chip and Marty. Uh, so I, I'm trying to understand did the feds then consider someone eight, uh, over 17 or over an adult and, and give them a $1,200 check? I mean, or did they just leave out uh, two years worth of? I, I don't know. I'm going to have to go and look at that. That's a good question. Is there a gap or did that 17-year-old that get treated as an adult? I, I need to look at that. And, and 18, I, I 18 year olds out. would have been covered not it would just be 17 year olds that were left out yeah uh okay yeah i, I guess we need some more information I, i'm inclined as much as we can to follow the uh federal program but i do think that if, if it turns out that 17 year olds were considered adults, which I, I'd be surprised if they were, but that would increase the fiscal note. Yeah, I'm, I'm, 
if that would um, increase it or not. I, I, because I, I mean, usually we think of under 18 or 17 and under and not, I've never seen a 17 year old just excluded from both definitions. Anyway, um, I think we just need a little more information before we, yeah. guess. before we guess. Okay, Marty? I would agree, it sounds like we need more information. My gut reaction is we should make our program as close to the federal program as it was, because that's our intent to extend that same benefit to people who did not get it before. Uh, and my conclusion from those remarks is that a 17 year old could have apl applied as an adult under the federal program. Uh, and if that's the case, then that would be the same thing here. The 17 year old could apply or the 18 year old could apply as an adult under this program as well. So I guess just clarification on that. Okay, thank you. Um, and any other questions for Mike or Nolan? Okay, thank you, Mike and Nolan. And, and as we work through this, Mike, we may pull you back in or uh, send information through CHIP if, you're, if your schedule is just jammed. Sure, no worries. Have a good day. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Nolan. <coughs> And so um, what I think we should do at this point is take a 10 minute break and then come or 10 or 15 minute break and then come back. And we're going to, um, I'd like to take just about another half hour at the most on this bill. And so that Chip, um, he will be working with Susanna so that when we bring Susanna back in, we make sure we, we, um, we, get, we can get some clarification of the direction our committee wants to take and that, um, that uh, she can weigh in as well uh, on our direction to make sure that we're serving the population um, that I think she has a, a pretty good heartbeat on. Um, and, um, and if she doesn't, who we need to have come in to, to help us uh, work through this. <clears throat> 